Welcome to The Prescription, the Tax Policy Center's webcast on fiscal policy. This is one of a series of conversations with state, local, and federal government officials, as well as leading economists and other experts. I'm your host, Howard Gleckman, a senior fellow at TPC. My guest today is Libin Zhang. He's a tax partner at the law firm of Free Frank and a member of the New York State Bar Association's Tax Section Executive Committee. He received his JD from Harvard Law School and his LLM in taxation from NYU. And he recently wrote a fascinating piece on tax and large language models uh, for tax notes. Uh, I think we can put a link uh, to that column in the chat. Uh, before we begin, our usual bit of housekeeping. We encourage audience members to submit questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. The event's being recorded and will be posted online at TPC's website in the near future. We're using captioning, which you can adjust or turn off with a live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you'd like to join the conversation on social media, please use the hashtag live at urban. And if you'd like to suggest a future guest for the prescription, just email us at info at taxpolicycenter.org. Libin, welcome to the prescription. Uh, great, thank you, Howard. Uh, glad to be here. So let's start with some definitions. We hear people talk about large language models, artificial intelligence, machine learning. What are they talking about? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. And you know, this field is, is really evolving um, every day as we speak. But basically, uh, I think one thing to keep in mind is that the term artificial intelligence, I think, creates this perception of, you know, like data from Star Trek or, you know, some sort of, you know, super intelligent computer. And that's not quite true yet. I would say um, these large language models are basically uh, computer programs that are fancy versions of the, the autocomplete function that you have on your iPhone. You know, when, when you type in a word, the autocomplete will sort of think about what you are thinking about next and, and fill out the rest of the sentence. And, and these are really much more advanced versions of it. You know, they're trained on data from the internet or, you know, other, you know, you know data sets. And that will um, enable this program to kind of provide a very nuanced autocomplete function to your, your question. Uh, but as, as we have seen from you know, recent news articles about airline lawsuits, sometimes th those answers are not quite what is um, expected. So for that tax notes piece, you, you ran a series of very simple experiments. Uh, why don't we just focus on one to give people sort of a sense of what happened? And, and let's let's talk about Picasso. I think that was a that was a good example. Yeah. Yes. Um, so so the question uh, the, the way the, these chat bot, you know, chat GPT and other programs, um, you know, Bing Chat and Google Bard, the way they work is you you have a like a web you know web page and there's a prompt. You type in a question and it's, it's going to give you an answer. And it, it's similar to you know, Alexa or Siri, ex except right now they don't have voice recognition. You, you have to type it in. And then it, after a couple of seconds, it spits out an answer based on its you know, knowledge, um, you know, based on this sort of fancy autocomplete that I'm talking about. And, and the question I gave it was, um, can I do a like-kind exchange if I sell my Picasso painting, um, and, and basically, can I sell my painting, buy something else, and defer the tax in, in a like kind exchange? The the real answer is is no, because um, the the Trump you know Tax Cuts and Jobs Act repealed like kind exchanges for personal property. It, it only applies to real property. Uh, unfortunately, this you know sort of simple yes or no question um, got sort of not very accurate answers from all these language models, uh, they basically said yes, um, or they kind of switched back and forth between yes or no. Um, I, I think partly because the training data that they have is based on pre-2018, you know, internet articles that say you can still do it with, you know, pick up with paintings or, or whatever, personal property. And then I, I like a, a few weeks later, I asked the same question and, um, you know, funnily enough, Bing Chat now has the correct answer. And as a source for this answer, it cites my very same article that had criticized its response. So it, it is learning a bit, um, which, which, is, which is good. Um, but it does raise another question, which is, 
anybody can post anything they want on the internet, you know, what's to stop someone from polluting the, the internet with false information, and then that gets fed into these language models. So, so if I understand correctly, your, 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 your suggestion is what happened here was there were so many articles that were written about the pre-TCJA law, the, the yeah. software searched, it found this preponderance of older articles, it couldn't understand that the law changed, but there are fewer articles post TCJA than pre TCJA, so it's simply accepted what it learned before. I, I think that that's my hypothesis. Um, you know, obviously there have been plenty of articles since then. You know, the, the law changed in late 2017, so it's been quite a few years of people talking about the new rules. But I, I do think that's that's one you know explanation, perhaps among many. And you know, tax law, as as we all know, is a fairly rapidly evolving field with you know legislation every year or every two years, and you can't really have a you know encyclopedia from you know 1960 to answer all your tax questions, you know, based on these language models. So when I think about this, I think about three domains, and what I'd like to do is is explore. Uh, uh, AI in all three. One of them is tax professionals and their sophisticated clients, uh, tax administrators, and then ordinary taxpayers. So let's start with tax professionals. And, and this is sort of your, your world, I guess. Yes. So I understand that large accounting and law firms already are making big investments in these tools. For example, PwC put out a press release saying it's going to spend a billion dollars over the next three years on AI. Uh, it's partnering with open generative AI service called Harvey. KPMG talks about using MindBridge Analytics, another one. Many firms are partnering with Microsoft's OpenAI. At least 250 firms are using a, a, a program called BlueJay Tax, which says it can predict tax outcomes. For example, it can tell you how a judge is likely to rule based on a specific set of facts. So right now, given the state of the technology, how useful are these services to tax professionals like you? Yeah, that's, I think that's a great question. I, I think you have to divide it into two things. You know, what is the status today and what do we expect in the future? Um, it's, in my opinion, um, the tools today are not super useful for tax professionals, except in sort of more limited capacities. Um, as, you know, we, I think, you know, one example is, and this was discussed in my article, um, OpenAI, you know, the, the, the number one company in, in this field, the, the, found, the creator of ChatGPT, they did this YouTube demonstration of GPT-4 doing tax analysis. You know, like somebody rehearsed it and this, this video got over 3 million views on, on YouTube. Unfortunately, so what they did was they asked, you know, this hypothetical couple with some income in 2018, can GPT-4 calculate the tax liability? And it's spat out an answer um, based on Section One of the Internal Revenue Code. Unfortunately, it was it was not the correct answer, um, and it was weird that nobody at the company kind of picked up on it. But it, it used the obsolete tax brackets um, in Section One A that go up to thirty nine point six percent. And what happened was when Trump change the tax brackets in 20, you know for 2018 through 2025 it added us like a separate like a like a like an annex you know section 1j which had special brackets for 2018 through 2025 that go up to only 37 percent so so the answer was like four thousand dollars off and, and so I, I think that was you know kind of high, a highly visible um situation where the, the program Kind of failed in in the tax analysis, uh, and then um, you know a similar example in the non-tax field was when Google Bard was first introduced. Um, Google had a you know very exciting live demo, and, and Google Bard gave the wrong answer for an astronomy question. Um, so so it, it was you know it's, it's like how how like I feel like these things should have been you know vetted a little bit better um, before they they presented out to to the public. Um, so. I would say, uh, unless you already know the answer, um, it's not that useful to like kind of give you an answer to a question that you don't know already know the answer. And, and if you already know the answer, you know maybe it's helpful to like just confirm what you thought. But then then it's not like a um, you know it doesn't really expand your your knowledge to, to the same degree. You know, the, some of these sources 
don't have citations or other tools that, um, you know, like traditional research tools um, can use. So, so I would say in short, the traditional research tools we have are, you know, probably more useful for tax professionals. Now, in the future, these things might change, but I think it's going to require a lot of testing and, um, you know, verification of accuracy before people can really rely on them. So what do you think accounts for all this buzz now? I mean, are, are we at some inflection point or is this just one of those trends that's just going to go away in two weeks and we'll be thinking about the next thing? Yeah, I, I think th there's a little bit of um, excitement about the potential for the technology. Uh, you know, like people may remember a couple of years ago, there was a big buzz about 3D printing um, that, you know, there's a, there's a bit of a mini bubble in the stock market with 3D printing companies. So, you know, obviously 3D printing still exists and, and many people use it, but I would not say it's a, it's a pervasive aspect of, of our lives right now. Uh, so I, I think there is a little bit of um, hype, so to speak, with these um, language models. I think partly because of the use of the term AI, which creates sort of a false impression about their actual capabilities. Uh, and, and also, you know, a lot of the, um, the, the people who write about AI are by definition sort of early adopters who are interested in AI. So, so they are by definition, you know, more likely to be fans uh, or they are affiliated with, you know, companies that are selling AI services and are, you know, you know, have a have an interest in generating more interest in in AI. So let's talk about where it may be useful and where maybe it's not so useful right now. In a, in a recent Tax Notes webcast, uh, Sherda Chernwu uh, said her firm, her firm EY, did an experiment way back in 2015. It asked an experienced practitioner to prepare sales and use tax filing based on a specific set of facts. Uh, she said it took the veteran staff for 90 minutes to prepare the document. And then they gave the same job to an early version of AI and it took three and a half minutes. So is, is, is this a possible use for the technology at this point to do sort of routine preparation of, of, of tax filings? I, I, think, I think that is definitely possible, but that's not really um, sort of the consumer facing, you know, chat bot type of AI that we're, we're really, you know, kind of generating a lot of interest. You know, there, for, for, for years and years, there have been programs, you know, like TurboTax or whatever, where you, you put in the information and it's going to give you the right answer, you know, within a very finite set of constraints. You know, like, I, I don't know why the professional took 90 minutes, um, but, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of manual calculations and things like that. So I think a very limited um, parameter set of parameters for a, a specific tool is, is definitely something that, you know, can be done, uh, but that's not new. That's not what's generating the excitement. The excitement is this sort of open-ended, you know, like sort of like almost like a thinking machine that will kind of reason and give you an essay and explain the answer, you know, and, and things like that. You know, the, the, the program that's doing a sales and use tax filing is not going to explain to you each step of the way um, in, in the sense that chat GPT can. But I think that's the danger once you open it up to more creative analysis, sometimes that creativity can be, um, you know, wrong or, you know, just, you know, go off on the wrong, on the wrong track. So, so she kind of distinguished in, in that webcast, she actually distinguished between sort of the routine processes of, of uh, gathering, inputting and cleaning data. She said that takes 50 to 70 percent of the time of a practitioner. Um, and she suggests that that's the kind of thing AI can do. And if it does, that can give the professionals more time to do the analysis, which is where their value added is. Do you agree with that? Yes, I think that's definitely correct. But I feel like maybe that's that's sort of slapping the AI label on, on something that's not quite, you know, AI. You know, like if, if, if you use you know, Microsoft Excel to clean up some data and, and run a couple of macros. I feel like, you know, I'm sure it's very time saving, but it's it's not the uh, the type type of AI that that we're we're really kind of talking about today. Um, so I I would if we I, you know it is possible that we'll live in a world where somebody can pull up ChatGPT or you know Google Bard or whatever and type in a word problem about his or her tax situation and ChatGPT will give a you know 
word response to that question that that is accurate. But I think we're a little bit far away from that world right now. Um, you know, it's going to take quite a bit of you know either investment or trial and error before we can rely upon that answer. Because uh, you know, as 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 we learned from you know the, the court case where the um, the lawyer got fake cases from ChatGPT, uh, you kind of have to know what is the right answer or have the ability to verify the answer anyway before you can really rely upon that information. Uh, and once you're doing that, you know, I'm I'm not sure if the, the chatbot is really adding a lot of value to to the process. So I think one of the interesting things, and this goes beyond uh, uh, ChatGPT and, and the rest, is is you know my experience, and I'm not a lawyer, but my experience in tax is that often th there is no actual objective correct answer to a tax question. The law is so complicated that often you ask practitioners about. Uh, an issue and you get three different answers and any of, any of them are legitimately correct. Yes, that, that's great. That, that's a very good point. That, that's actually one of my other questions in, in the article that I wrote for Tax Notes, which is a more open-ended question. And um, it, it the, the issue kind of flew by the, the chat box. They, they didn't really, they gave like a more simple answer. Um, and, and so I, I think for that kind of nuanced legal reasoning, um, you still need a, a tax professional, you know, human being to really kind of analyze it and, and focus on it, uh, which is, you know, great for people in my profession. Uh, we're, we're still good for at least a, a couple of years in terms of job security. <laughs> I suspect um, a little more than that, but I got it. Yeah. So let, let's, I, you just you just alluded to this, but let, let's talk a little more detail uh, uh, about this problem of uh, uh, judicial opinions. And, and for the audience, if they're not familiar with it, the story is that there have been now a couple of cases, they're not tax cases, but a couple of cases where litigators have cited uh, uh, prior opinions uh, in, in filings to judges uh, AI using, uh, using AI. Uh, the AI gives them perfectly formatted citations and case summaries, but there's just one problem. The cases are either entirely different from what the chatbot describes, or the cases sometimes don't exist at all. Th this, I understand, is called hallucinating. Uh, what's going on here? How does this even happen? Yeah, I, I think there, there are two kind of separate issues with that. One is um, the, these chatbots are, it's very hard for them to say, no, I, I don't know the answer. Uh, you know, if you ask Alexa, you know, it, it's a question, it's going to search on the internet, and if it doesn't have the answer, it will just say, no, I, I don't know the answer. If you ask ChatGPT, it's going to try to come up with an answer based on its data set, its, its corpus. And when we're talking about fields that require a high level of, of accuracy, it's not going to give you what you want. Um, you know, like if, if you ask these models for like a picture of you know, a dinosaur riding, you know, a, a go-kart, it's going to give you that answer because it's going to be able to extrapolate and, and give you what, what you want. Uh, if you ask it for a case that cites, you know, the law about a dinosaur riding a go-kart, it's going to give you a text answer for what you want. But, you know, that's not what you actually want, like the reality of these cases, not a, a made up, you know, product. Um, so, you know, the, the chat GPT is great if you want to write like a Shakespearean sonnet about tax law or, or some some other creative endeavor, but it, it doesn't really give you, um, you know, like, and, and so so once again, you know, these fields are quite high level of accuracy. It's not the, 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 the right tool at the moment. Um, now, traditional research tools like, you know, Bloomberg or, or whatever, you know, they, they will only give you actual information. They will not make up anything. You know, everything they, they provide is either like a primary authority or, or some something written by, you know, like like a like a human being. And you're, you'll never get a hallucination. Uh, now, that being said, there, there, there are mistakes in, in these sources, but that's, you know, a much more limited situation. So so this sounds a little bit like I mean, you were joking before about, you know, the lawyers have any future, but the, the, the present state sounds a little bit like some of this technology can be used to do the kinds of work that a first or second year associate might do in a, in a, in a law firm. Uh, is that really what we have here, a, a, a digital lower cost associate? And if it is, what's the role of these young lawyers gonna be? 
Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I, I allude to this to, to my, in my article that, you know, let's just take the Picasso question, right? That, that's really a question that, um, you know, you, like a, a partner could ask a very junior associate to do some research. And that person who is, you know, semi-competent can pull up section 1031 and or 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 just do some internet searching and get the right answer. And um, you know, if that person gets the wrong answer, there's there's like a little bit of accountability in, in that the, the person is highly motivated to to not be incorrect. Uh, you, you put in the same question for chat GPT, you get the wrong answer, there's no consequence, it just you know says sorry, you know, too too bad. Uh, and so I, I think the, the associates are, are definitely still much more useful in that respect. Um, and plus, you know, the, the part of what we why we have associates is that they are, you know, being trained to be the, the future generation of, of partners or um, you know in-house counsel in at, at some point. And if we don't provide that training, you know, you know, if we cut out the youngest generation, then eventually the, the profession will, you know whether mm -hmm. so so does does this suggest that you can find better uses for those associates or will they still as part of their training be required to go back and find the cases i, I think one one possible outcome is sort of a hybrid approach where they use chat gpt or you know other tools to assist in their research um, just, just like you know, like everybody nowadays, you know, do do internet searches for for some tax questions, um, but they they still need to be mindful of that that you know they're responsible for their actions. Uh, you know, the, the problem with the, the court case with the airline um, or the fake citations wasn't necessarily that ChatGPT gave the wrong answer; is that the lawyer just took it on blind faith that the answer was correct. Um, he never really verify that these cases exist. So it's, it's really more about poor um, lawyering practices versus relying on the wrong tools. You know, if, if I do a Google search and, you know, I pull some information from Wikipedia that turned out to be inaccurate, that's not necessarily Wikipedia's fault. It, it's really the, the person, the user's um, fault. So I have to ask, you're a practitioner, you're, you're doing legal research every day. Do you rely on AI for any of your legal research? Uh, yeah, so actually, I the answer is a little bit. Um, I, the, the other day, I had a, a question about a, um, a non-US law issue. It was actually a UK law issue. And, um, you know, people complain about the US tax code being complicated, but I, I feel like, and, and, you know, the tax law being like a foreign language, well, I think that's even more true when I'm looking at, you know, other countries' tax statutes. And uh, ChatGPT was was actually pretty helpful in giving me a, you know, semi-useful answer about a UK law issue that I was researching. So I, I think it, it's, it is useful for um, kind of very basic research that you can then go back onto the internet or non-AI research sources to confirm because it points you in the right direction. Um, but if you're just trying to understand the the, the law um, solely relying on chat GPT, I, I think that's a, a greater problem. Uh, and, and then, you know, th there, there are these other situations where um, some of these companies can give you like probability estimates of, of cases. I, I'm, I feel like that's still you know, in its infancy, um, partly because these these companies are seem to be a hundred percent right all the time, um, which you know is is not quite how these probabilities should, should really work out. And and if they're a hundred percent right, you probably don't need them, right? That's that's correct. Yeah. Uh, let's let's switch gears a little bit. Let me ask you about tax administrators. Uh, mm -hmm. there, of course, been a big debate in Congress over the last year about whether the IRS should get more money to upgrade its technology, and some of that includes AI. What do you think the role is going to be for some of this technology for tax administrators like the, like the IRS? Are they going to be able to use this in a, in a, in a valuable way? Yeah, I, I think I'm sure a lot of people have been thinking about this. Um, but, you know, like the other day, I tried the IRS Interactive Tax Assistant, um, which is their current, you know, non-AI sort of interactive, you know, like the, the question was, 
do I do I need to file a tax return? And it asks you a bunch of questions and then it gives you a yes or no answer. And it, it was okay, um, except it got really into the weeds. You know, it asked you like about section 965, you know, which is like, do you own foreign stock of a corporation? Like, you know, the, the person using these can these tools, which are presumably unsophisticated taxpayers, can get easily intimidated. Um, so I think there is some room for AI to make the questions more user friendly. And, you know, like it's like when you go on Amazon, there's there's like a little chatbot where, you know, the, the, the questions are sort of tailored to your prior response instead of just being the same question for everybody in, in, a, in a list. So I, I think there is some room for um, improvement in that respect. But I think in terms of the, the full-blown AI, uh, at the moment, it's probably not going to be a, a good idea for the IRS to use them in their present state, given the risk of the AI providing the, the wrong information. Uh, and then, you know, like even if it gives the right answer 99.9% .9 of the time, that still means, you know, thousands of people will get the wrong answer if millions of people are using this tool. And, and that's just thousands of people who are going to have a really hard time in life when they rely on this information. So, so you really need 100% accuracy. What about internally? So, so we, we had a panel uh, uh, recently that discussed how IRS can use machine learning. And one example that came up was um, the problem uh, the IRS is plagued with no change audits. They do, they do many, many audits that, that simply don't result in any change in the, the taxpayer's liability. Could the IRS or state tax authorities, for that matter, do a better job of using technology to do a, a sort of a triage to, uh -huh. to help them understand where they could get the biggest bang for the buck, where the audits are going to be most productive and avoid uh, getting trapped in this in this web of sort of no change audits? Yeah, I, I think that's definitely, but I, I think that's more along the lines of the you know earlier, like the sales and use tax you know, computer that's filling in the data. You know, I, I think that there's definitely uh, a lot of potential for these limited role um, machine, you know, they're really computer programs. I, I would say they're not AI in either the colloquial sense or the, you know, science fiction sense. You know, this is just a, a computer program that can sort of analyze, you know, millions of tax returns and say, you know, we're weighing these factors and, you know, please take a look at this. I think in terms of the consumer facing um, chatbots, you know, will an, an IRS employee pull up ChatGPT and ask it, you know, taxpayer information and get an answer about whether they should audit this taxpayer? I, I feel like that's, you know, a far, far from now. Um, and, you know, one other thing is there's um, somewhat very recent and, and surprising news, which is that they, these we, are, we, we don't know a lot about the vulnerabilities of these AI models and, and how they're, they can be you know, potentially hacked. Um, in, you know, the, there's this board game, Go, um, you know, which for a long time had AI as all the top players, you know, beat all the human players. Uh, but then late last year, somebody figured out a way to basically beat all these computer Go programs using, you know, amateur human level expertise. Uh, there's sort of a very major flaw in these Go computer models. So I think likewise, if if, if the IRS becomes, you know, highly reliant on AI or machine learning technology, there might be gaming opportunities where people do certain things to, to get around what they think is the, the computer's algorithms. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So uh, before we go, I have to also mention that you asked ChatGPT, Bard and Bing to tell you a lawyer joke. And it came up with several and, and I'm, I'm going to read one of them. Why did the tax lawyer bring a calculator to the beach? Answer, to calculate the depreciation of the sandcastle. It also added, note, these jokes are meant to be lighthearted and not offend anyone working in the tax law field. I have to say at this stage, it's safe to say that large language tax jokes are not offensive, nor are they funny. Uh, Libin Zhang, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you about this and, uh, and let's see what happens with this, uh, with this technology. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Howard.